we can get everybody to sit down, please. We can get started. Well, these lectures go really fast, don't they? We're coming to the last hour of the morning sessions. And with us this morning is uh, Brother Nathan Combs, born in California. It's a good place to be born in. That's where I was born. Mostly grew up in southeast Texas, and uh, he's been a preacher since uh, full-time about uh, 2009. Um, worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and just most recently in Tingsboro, Massachusetts and has moved to Rantoul, Illinois just very recently. And so uh, I, I remember him with fondness as a student here, and we're glad to see him here back with us. So please give him your attention, Nathan Combs. Well, good morning to you all. It's been such a pleasure to be with you this week to consider this magnificent New Testament book with you. Uh, to learn more about the grace of Jesus and the encouragement we find in here to keep pressing forward into it. So I would invite you to join me in chapter 12 now as we continue studying. Chapter 12, we're going to read verses 4 through 17 together. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. I'm sure that there are words in the English language that fill you with all kinds of warm and fuzzy feelings when you hear them and you use them, but the word discipline is probably not one of those words. Because the word discipline implies some degree of discomfort and usually even pain. Doesn't the Hebrew writer kind of reference that in verse 11? where he says, all discipline for the moment seems painful rather than pleasant. But as we read through the text together just now, you notice that surely that discipline is 
the dominant word of this text. In the English Standard Version that I usually teach and study out of, it shows up nine different times, and I'm sure there's a spectrum of translations in this room. It's probably showing up in yours as well. And when you think about the word discipline, it probably conjures up some scenes from childhood for you, scenes of punishment, maybe some strenuous conversations and some serious consequences that followed those conversations. But in the original language that Hebrews was written in, the word that's translated discipline in our Bibles more broadly means education or instruction or training. To directly quote from a lexicon is the act of providing guidance for responsible living. It could include the idea of punishment, but that's just one of the tools uh, in the tool belt of an instructor. And here in Hebrews, the overall tone of this whole letter and of this section in particular is not God is punishing you for your sins, but rather God is in a training period with you as he is moving you through these trials. So stay in school and don't skip out on your lessons is the idea here. And as you read the rest of the letter, as we've already been studying thus far this week, you'll notice that these people are in such desperate need of training. Back in chapter 5, which we've already looked at in 11 and 12, you, you read there that the Hebrew writer has to stop in the middle of this deep discussion of the priesthood of Melchizedek and Jesus to say, you guys are so dull of hearing, you can't even appreciate or understand the things that I'm trying to tell you about, let alone turn to somebody else and try to help them understand the deeper things of God. And according to our text here in chapter 12, verse 12, you notice what he says. They're tired. They've got weak knees. They've got drooping hands. They're losing their motivation to press on. So they needed a letter to remind them of who they were and the eternal significance of the path that they were on despite all of the opposition that they have faced in the past and seem to continue to face At the moment that they got this letter, we desperately need those reminders as well. And so I'm so excited to talk about this section with you. We're going to talk about the context a little bit, and then we're going to break up this text into three different sections and move through them piece by piece before we finally ask the question of ourselves, are we trainable like we know that we should be? First of all, the context. What form did this training take? Is this disease that is springing up in the bodies of these people, is it natural disasters that they're living through, some sort of drought, famine, something like that? I don't think it is. But we do know that God uses those kinds of things in order to test and train his children We know that uh, James says, for example, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Job, for example, when you open up that book, he had boils that, that just sprouted up all over his body. His kids are killed when a wind destroys the house that they're feasting in. All kinds of things happen. Fire falls from the sky and burns up his sheep. But in the case of the Hebrews, I think they're living through a different kind of trial. They are living through mistreatment at the hands of the local unbelievers that they are living amongst. And so verse 4, in the first verse that we read together, you notice that he plainly says, nobody is getting thrown up on crosses, nobody's getting taken out back and stoned to death, uh, nobody is, is, is getting crucified. Um, verse 4 is pretty clear, you haven't lost any blood But they have lost other things, haven't they? In chapter 10, verse 33, we notice that they have lost, some of them, honor because of the moments of public shaming that they have experienced. In the next verse, in 1034, some of them have experienced the theft of their property. In in 13.3, not only were we reading about earlier in the letter, moments of prison that they were going through in the past. But in 13.3, he says, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. Some have lost their freedom. And so in many ways, this is a more difficult kind of hardship 
than experiencing disease and natural disasters and accidents and all those other things. Because it's one thing to, to wake up in the morning and look out at your field and notice that a random wildfire has moved through the area and has just taken out your harvest. That's really hard, but it's hard on a different kind of level when your neighbor comes over in the morning and he looks you in the face and he says, I hate you, I hate your family, I hate everything that you stand for because you are teaching that that false prophet from Nazareth is God in human flesh. That is blasphemous. We got to shut you down for that. So the neighbors and I got together and we decided that we're going to take your crop this year and we're going to burn what we can't use ourselves. And if you try to go to the authorities about it, they're not going to care a lick about what we're doing to you. Obviously, that's a fictitious scenario, but it's not too far of a stretch to imagine something like that going on amongst these Hebrew Christians based on the things that we are told that they are dealing with. It's obvious when you read this letter, these Hebrew Christians were not just affected in terms of their financial worth or their their physical bodies. It's damaging them psychologically because fellow humans who should be caring about them are turning against them because of the gospel. And so they are losing their perspective. They are close to throwing in the towel, and they seem to be forgetting that the belligerent neighbors that they have, they're encountering them and experiencing them in the midst of a trial that God is taking them through. They're undergoing the training of their heavenly father, and they don't seem to recognize that at the moment. And so this section here in chapter 12 is written as a way of saying, here's how you respond to the training of your father. Five through eight, point number one, you need to recognize it as a sign of your value to your father. Has there ever been a child to come out of the womb who didn't need so many different kinds of training on so many different kinds of levels? It's kind of mind-boggling for parents like me to sit back and just ponder all of the different ways that my two-year-old needs to learn about life and about God in order to grow up to be a fully functional member of the community and a person of faith. But parents take on the years-long job of instructor to their children because they care immensely for the offspring that comes from them. Every son or daughter requires training, and so every son and daughter is going to receive that. And wise children understand the worth of what they are receiving. Do you remember in Acts 5 when the apostles are rounded up by the very people who condemned their Lord to death, and they are beaten, and they are threatened, and they are sent packing. Do you remember how they left that room rejoicing? Why? Because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. The experience of bearing the scorn of the world did not mean that God was inattentive to them, that he didn't care about them. On the contrary, it proved that they belonged to God, that they were legitimate sons and not outside of the family of God. All fathers trained their sons. It's interesting that this way of reframing pain extends back to the Old Testament. You'll notice in the text that we read, he goes back to the Proverbs, specifically Proverbs 3 in verses 5 through 6 here, to talk about what they should be thinking about as they move through their lives. It's interesting, when you go back to the Proverbs, they are written primarily by a father, Solomon, who is trying to train his sons Rehoboam and the other ones that he had, uh, he was not very successful in that in terms of the way that his sons received that teaching. But he's trying to train them as a father would to live in harmony with wisdom, the operational code that God used to set up this universe that we are living in even today. And so Solomon says at the very outset of Proverbs that the things that I'm telling you and trying to train you with are for everybody at all age levels. Proverbs 1 verses 4 through 5 
he says, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth, but also let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. As a side note application, may none of us ever ever believe that we have reached a point in our earthly lives before we reach the eternal gates where we are trained and we are done learning and we are done maturing and growing in the ways of the Lord. Let the wise hear and increase in learning too. And this training that our Father is meaning to give us is meant to penetrate to the very level of our cores and change us from the inside out. It's interesting that all the way around the quote in Proverbs that the Hebrew writer plucks out, all in that context are Proverbs about the heart. For example, chapter 4, verse 12, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. God cares enough about his children that he wants nothing less than a complete revolution at the state of the soul as we move through the spiritual education that he wants to give us. That's point number one. That's five through eight. Look at verses nine through 11 again. Point number two on how to respond appropriately to God's training is you need to trust his methods and his goals entirely. It's interesting, one of, the, one of the hardest things for children to do in their relationship with their parents, something that I struggled with when I was two and three and beyond, something that my children struggle with as well, is, is trying to let go of attempting to understand everything that they're supposed to do and to just simply do it. Um, what all children want to know, especially with instructions that are hard, that are painful to some extent, is this question of, why do I have to do that? Or why do I have to do it that way? Or why do I even have to do it at all? <laughs> but I'm, I'm just not going to spend 15 minutes explaining to my three-year-old why I want him to do all the things that I want him to do. We hopefully learn that lesson as kids. But sometimes, if you're like me, you have to relearn that lesson again in your relationship with your heavenly Father as you mature in the faith of Jesus. He doesn't owe us an explanation for every difficult situation that he takes us through. Do you remember the book of Job? How Job spends the entire book wanting to talk to God and not his boneheaded friends. And then he finally gets a chance to do that at the very end of the book. And God comes down in a whirlwind and what does God say? Well, let me explain to you what was going on behind the curtain of heaven. Satan came into the throne room and we had this discussion about you. And that's kind of why. Everything that God does is simply in the form of 10,000 questions that he asks Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Can you look at the constellations in the universe, the bear and the Pleiades? Can you control them? Can you go over to the Leviathan and the behemoth and wrestle them to the ground? Oh, you can't. Well, then you need to let me be God. And you need to keep your mouth shut. And you need to trust your father. I love how the Hebrew writer makes an argument from the lesser to the greater. It's really powerful in these verses. If you trusted your earthly dad, in his training that he was giving you, even though he is and all dads are imperfect and limited, I've got six kids, I feel those limitations acutely myself when I look at my own character. But if you trusted more or less the training of your dad, how much more are you going to trust your heavenly father? If your earthly dad had good goals for you and he helped you to move forward and achieve those good goals as my earthly father certainly did, how much more are you going to trust that God knows what is good for you, his child that he cares so deeply about? We may not understand, in fact, we will not understand on this side of eternity why he takes us down the roads that he does, but we know where the destination is and we understand that it is glorious. 
That's point number two. And now we get to 12 through 17. The way to respond to God's training doesn't just have to do with you. It has to do with helping your fellow disciples respond well to their training. One of the major drumbeats of the scriptures is this idea that God blesses you so that you can turn around and bless the other people all around you. Isn't that Genesis 12 too? When when God looked at Abraham, when he was picking out this man, what did he say to him at the very start of their relationship? I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And I'm going to give you uh, this land. I'm going to give you a family. I'm going to give you a position amongst the nations of the world so that you can bless the nations of the world. And just to pull another one completely out of the hat, you remember what Jesus said to Peter? Right before his moment of temptation, he said, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I'm I'm praying that God blesses you so that when you have turned again, what are you supposed to do now? Strengthen your brothers because they're going to need a lot of help too. All of the privileges and the blessings that God pours out into our laps are meant to be enjoyed by us individually. I'm thankful when I look at myself and my life that I am saved, but that salvation is meant to be poured out into the laps of other people who do not have the same privileges as you and I do. To borrow the language of Tim the other night, we as the insiders are supposed to be oriented toward the outsiders. So when these Hebrew Christians received this letter, God wanted them to feel individually encouraged by the blessings of of what Jesus has done for us in his kingship, in his priesthood. But he also wants these people to feel a renewed appreciation for the collective responsibility that they have to look towards each other and to lift up drooping hands and to strengthen weak knees. It is not every man for himself. It is not survival of the fittest on an individual level. It is, I'm going to look to you to give you some of the things that God has given to me. And that, that, is, that is apparent when you read these instructions. It is especially clear when you get down to verses 15 and 16, when he says, see to it that you personally, no, see to it that no one, fails to obtain the grace of God, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy. Our level of responsibility for the lives of fellow disciples is high and not low. And yet, how easy is it to turn a blind eye to a brother and sister who is struggling? And we might justify it in all kinds of ways. We might say, well, Didn't Paul say in Galatians that each one is going to have to bear his own load? Didn't Paul say in Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? He's got to do that himself. And if he really wants to talk, I mean, my number is in the directory. He knows where I live. He knows how to find me. But after all, I mean, he's just stopped coming to church. He's not joining the assemblies anymore. He's pulled away from the group. And so he probably doesn't want to even hear what I have to say anyway. Maybe he doesn't at the moment, but it is still your responsibility to go bang on his door, to set yourself on his sofa, to look him in the eye and give him the scriptures that he needs to hear. Because if he's flirting... With the open jaws of the evil one, he needs to know it. My wife and I have been in those living rooms. We've been on those couches. We've had those conversations. And looking around at this room, I know that many of you have as well. Those are so painful. They're so awkward. They're so hard on so many levels but they are far more biblical. They are far more loving than ignoring the situation for eight months and then sending a withdrawal letter in the mail in an impersonal way. 
God, help us to love each other more fervently than that. God, help us to leave the 99 and go in search of the one who is scared and lost and encircled by wolves but doesn't know it and doesn't know how to communicate it to other people. Obviously, we need to assume the best about each other's lives and not nail each other to the wall at every opportunity. I mean, did you do your Bible reading yesterday? But if the evidence is mounting, that there is a serious problem, that pointed questions need to be asked, that even drastic actions need to be taken, we need to have the courage and the compassion to do it. Yes, there is time to deliver someone over to Satan. But that should be the very last step of a long process in which you and I have done what this passage here is admonishing us to do, to look around at people who are weak and to do what we can to help lift them up. And by the way, I'll just say this, that if at this point in what we have studied, you are thinking back to memories in your life in which you know you have failed to do what this text is telling you to do, please understand that I am right there with you in that boat. And right now I'm thinking about people who are maybe no longer in the body of Jesus because they've chosen to walk away, people that I have failed to to go knock on their door with, to go see and to go talk to. I need the grace of God just like you do. I have failed to do the very things that I am so strongly preaching about that we need to all do. And so I want to use the phrase that the Hebrew writer likes to use, this phrase, let us, to say, let us, verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Because all of us, no matter who you are, we have the potential to become Esau's. That's verse 16. You know, the problem with Esau in Genesis 25 was not that he was intensely hungry and tired when he walked in from the field after a long day of being out there hunting his game, and he comes in and and he's in this state. The problem with Esau was that he thought his hunger and his tiredness deserved immediate satisfaction at any cost. That is why he's called unholy in this text, or profane, or godless, some of your translations may say. What are unholy creatures fixed on? What Esau was fixed on, satisfying his own personal cravings. What are holy creatures fixed on? If you look at Isaiah 6, you look at any of the throne room scenes in the book of Revelation, All the holy creatures, all they can talk about, all they can think about, all they can look towards, even if they have wings in front of their faces, is the glory of their God. And you notice in the book of Hebrews, that's emphasized when it comes to the holy people of faith. In fact, even at the beginning of chapter 12, what we just looked at with Jason leading us through that study, where was Jesus looking When he went through his trials, notice what it says, verse 2 of chapter 12. We are to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him in his future, that's how he endured the cross. That led him to the right hand of God. When you go back to chapter 11, verse 26, what what does it say about Moses? Why did he leave his cushy life as a prince of Egypt, so to speak, to to move out and to end up as this wilderness leader of a grouchy and ungodly people? Why would he choose that life? Because 1126 says he is looking to the reward. When you go back to verse 10 of chapter 11, where does it say Abraham was looking Why did he leave his life in Ur to move to this foreign land of Canaan to live in a tent for the rest of his life? Because he is looking forward to the city that has foundations. But where is his grandson Esau looking? He's just looking down. 
as he comes in from the field. And he slobbers all over his brother's pot of lentils and he proceeds to give away the blessings of his future like they were worth the rocks on the ground. When I read Esau's story, I'm reminded of that well-known quote from C.S. Lewis from The Weight of Glory, where C.S. Lewis says, we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. If there is a hunger in your life that is beginning to dominate your affections, please, please humble yourself to reach out to your God and to the people that your God puts around you in your life to help you, to the accountability that you can find in the Lord's church To name one of those dangerous hungers in this text, you notice again the sexual immorality that he mentions there in verse 16. But he doesn't just mention it in this place. If you go over to chapter 13, this is one of his closing warnings to the Hebrew Christians. 13 verse 4, that famous verse, Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge thee sexually immoral and adulterous. Let's just get really practical about this. If your marriage right now in your life feels like a wilderness, do not, please, do not cast your eyes toward that sympathetic and attractive person that you work with or you, or you go to church with. Find a biblical counselor who is wise and learned in the scriptures of God. Work on your relationship with him first and foremost, but also on your marriage for the glory of God. If you're single in here, and your single life feels like a wilderness, please remember that your satisfaction will not be found in picking up a cheap date on a chintzy app. Your satisfaction will not be found in isolating yourself in your bedroom to give in to your unholy lusts. Your satisfaction will be found in making Jesus Christ your best friend. And your satisfaction will be found in throwing yourself into the work that he is giving us to do in this very section, to look around you at other people who are struggling in their faith, in their life, to hold up their hands and strengthen their knees. Because if we do not submit our hungers to the lordship of Jesus Christ, what's the alternative? The root of bitterness. And that's verse 15 here in our text. And the Israelites in the wilderness are such a prime example of how that works and what that looks like. Moses, how dare you lead us into this suicidal trip that we're on? Are we just out here to die in the wilderness? I mean, don't you know that we've got cattle? Don't you know that we've got kids? We need bread. We need water. We would really like to have some meat, kind of like the stuff that we had back in Egypt. And so Moses, if you're not going to take care of us and you're God, whoever he is, let's make a golden calf that will. Or let's worship this Baal of Peor that looks really attractive and the practices that go along with it. Or let's just go back to Egypt and voluntarily submit ourselves to the yoke of slavery again, because that seemed to work out pretty well for us in the past. Living in the wilderness does one of two things to you. It hopefully teaches you and me that our lives do not consist on bread alone. Our lives are supported and sustained by the grace of the one who speaks bread and everything else into existence. But if we don't learn that lesson, then life in the wilderness will make you bitter. It will harden your spirit. It will cause you to lose sight of the glory of the freedom from slavery that you have. And it will rub off on everybody else around you and encourage them to have the same bitter perspective that you have in your life. God, help us to embrace our training. 
The power and the challenge of this text lies in this question. Are you and I trainable? I'd like to think that I am. I know that you would like to think that you are. But what fruits are we actually showing that would demonstrate that that is true of our lives? If the training of this passage comes through painful interactions in being witnesses to the world that we live in, are we looking for ways to spiritually interact with the world around us? Showing up at the assemblies, throwing money in the plate, even keeping up with daily Bible reading and prayer, all of those things are not sufficient in and of themselves to demonstrate that we are trained sons and daughters of the King. Because if you look at the most hardened Pharisee of Jesus' day, he could trot out the same credentials, couldn't he? Do you remember the guy in Luke 18, Jesus' parable there? Well, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Yes, you do. And you're also bound for hell. Do you remember what he said there in Luke 18? The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. God saves us so that we can help the tax collectors, so that we can be with the other men, bringing them to the kingdom. And in the process of doing that, with its painful moments, that starts to burn off more and more of our sins to bring us closer as sons and daughters to the Heavenly Father that is trying to use us as his instruments in this world. When you invite the tax collectors into your life, you just never know what's going to happen. When you open your home on Tuesday nights to the friends and the neighbors that you have and they all crowd around in your living room mingling with your brothers and sisters in your same church and you open the Bible together, you don't know what's going to happen. When you look at your worldly friend and say, how can I pray for you today? Or would you like to meet at a coffee shop once in a while and read through the book of Mark with me? You don't know what's going to happen. When you find places in your community and you volunteer at a local shelter or a halfway home or you go into a prison where there are broken people who know they are broken, you don't know what's going to happen after that. No doubt, if you reach out to enough people, you're going to meet people who are the very same people that the... He, they are making the lives of these Hebrew Christians miserable, people who don't want Jesus Christ in their life and don't want the help of the king. But you're going to meet people who will. Jesus doesn't want us to live in a closed loop of Costco, maybe Walmart, church services, and our desk at work. If that is our life, that's my life, and it has been before, we are missing out on the training that our Father wants to give us. Something that you know for sure will happen when you interact with the people of the world is that, number one, you are giving them an opportunity to see the glory and the light of Jesus Christ in your life so that they can see your good works and magnify your Father in heaven. But number two, you know that those experiences are God's way of molding your spirit to bring, him, to bring you closer to him. May God give us the strength to be trained by our Father. And wherever you live, whatever your work is in the kingdom of God, and I know in a room like this, we are, all, we are found all over the United States and even foreign countries of this world. Wherever you are, may God lift up your drooping hands when you need it and strengthen your weak knees so that we can press forward together in the work 